Bow. What's up everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean and today I got a really special interview for you guys from a man named Tuco. Now Tuco has been an artist and he's seen all of the ups and downs. I'm talking about some creative ways to prevent promoters to start reaching out to you. They had promoters and big artists reaching out to them to open up shows and then having big names attached to them, getting signed, releasing the first project. The story goes on, but then also there's a lot of downs when it comes to hard lessons that him and his group had to learn and even coming to a point where a lot of artists get to when they reach a certain level and realize, is this something that I really want? And I left it in the full length interview instead of chopping it up because I believe it's best for you to see the whole story to really understand the lessons and the gems in this interview. And there's a lot of them because he went from being an artist to also helping other artists out and having a multimedia company that's working with artists that are working with people and writing for people like Chris Brown, Ty Dolla Sign, you name it. Now, for without further ado, I want to go ahead and get y'all to this value. So let's get it. It's Tuco. <laughs> What's up, Tuco? What's going on, brand man? Yo, I'm, I'm super excited to be on the channel, first and foremost, just because I saw you grow this channel and it's been an awesome thing to kind of see. So I'm glad you're back. I'm glad you're still yeah. doing it. Yeah, I'm hey, man, I, I appreciate that. So for those of you guys who don't know, before I get into the story, he is over Music ID TV. I know you guys have heard me shout that channel out here or there, or well, some of you have. But um, let's go go way back. Uh, Tuco, I know you're a singer, right? Right, right, yeah. So you toured with some pretty interesting people. You've been in a group, all these things. Mm -hmm. How did you get into music in the first place from when we talk about the serious point not when you started to dream about it and i wanted to be on my grind when you got um when you went on tour how did that process start to work out well i i would have to start a little bit before then i kind of grew up in the music industry my sister was signed to snoop dogg back in like 1999 so since then i got it <laughs> I got a chance to really see somebody having a dream and that it actually come to life and could come to fruition. So I kind of oh. watched it firsthand to see my sister writing songs in a room to like being on Rap City and being on MTV, you know what I mean? So yeah. in, uh, in 99 is when she signed a Snoop Dogg and ever since then, I kind of really witnessed that. And I wanted to do music probably like when I was nine. So um, wait, 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 wait. So who's your... Who's your sister? Is that a name we can look up? Find some okay, videos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys can look that up. It's uh, Cognac from Doggy's Angels. They released the uh, Please Believe It album in 2000 on TVT Records. <laughs> no longer around. It was, uh, but I think they might have been distributed through somebody else's TVT. But um, yeah, so that's okay. a Please Believe It album. Cognac from Doggy's Angels. She had the feather. Uh, her her uh, <laughs> name, Coney, uh, what was it? The Fair Fawcett of the Click. They were like, uh, okay. Doggy's Angels, yeah. <laughs> gotcha, so, gotcha. Um, when I was 15, I saw that, but a little bit before then, um, uh, my niece and I actually had started writing songs and then my mom always took it seriously. She's always been in her entertainment. They've always given like shows around the city and stuff like that. So when we were interested in music, she kind of really jumped on board. So she started taking us to studio sessions. Um, after that, I, I found a couple of people who ended up being like my cousin and my god brother. <laughs> who wanted to do music as well. So we all just started to do music together. Uh, it was kind of like a garage band. We started producing ourselves. We started okay. writing everything ourselves. We learned how to record everything ourselves. We learned how to mix. We learned how to do everything because nobody would teach us nothing. Right. Um, know that story. Yeah, you know what I mean? So uh, long behold, it ended up being about three of us in the end, which was my god brother and my cousin uh, doing mm. the music together. And uh, we was really ambitious. So we started to place Black History Month like festivals and like <laughs> any show that we could find in the local uh -huh. areas. Um, and this was in the Inland Empire in California. So if anything we could find in local areas, we started printing up flyers and passing out flyers, talking to promoters, anything that we could really pretty much do we had got accustomed to recording already. So at that time we had recorded like several albums in our minds, but we had one project we were really, really proud of. And uh, one day I randomly hit up um, Rafael Sadiq on MySpace of all things. And for 
<laughs> for okay. some of you who may not know who he is, um, producer, Grammy Award winning producer, like has had a career over 30 years, um, gearing up to release a new project. I've heard some stuff that's pretty awesome, but beyond that, just somebody you guys should definitely look up. So I've, yeah. I've always admired him. He's huge, for those huge. of you who don't know. Yes, huge, huge. R&B um, primarily. Yeah, like the godfather of Neo Soul, some people call him. Um, so always a huge fan, so I just decided to reach out, not to ask for anything, but literally to say, I'm a huge fan, would love to work with you someday. You know, at this time, it's us three. We're already doing shows. We have our little project. We got a couple songs on MySpace. We got photos, <laughs> all this shit. You know what I mean? So we're trying to get it popping. Um, and he just responds with his phone number and says, give me a call. All right, hold up, hold up, hold up. You said, I would like to work with you. Well, you know, admire you, blah, blah, blah. I would like yeah. to work with you one day. It stopped there or mm -hmm. actually said we got this band and gave him that information? It stopped there. I said, I would like to work with you. We would like to work with you someday in the future. Huge fans. Hmm. That was it. Okay. I, 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 I want to stop live. there just for one <laughs> second because like hearing how it played out or having an idea how it played out for you. One thing that I know is when you reach out to certain people, you don't have to push and beg a lot of people to listen to your music if they're going to or just check you out. If you've been doing what you're supposed to be doing, like it's already gonna be there on your social profile and they can go check it out for, you, for themselves. And people are more inclined to like listen to your stuff and maybe do something for you if they check go check it out and they say, oh, this person's dope. They'll either keep tabs on you or try to do something with you versus if you just ask them and now they're like, I get asked all the time. Like, but if you have your shit together and you've been doing it and it's already there, you put yourself in a way better position just had to make that note but uh continue yes definitely put yourself in a better position so there was no ass there he took it upon himself to listen to the music um gave me his phone number i freaked out <laughs> i didn't think it was him i didn't think it was real i called my you know my mom like uh rafael some people just gave me his phone number uh i called my bandmates like hey rafael some people just gave me his phone number my mom's like call him i'm like really you know, I'm kind of tripping out because it just, it just seems so, it seems like somebody so unreachable to yeah. just give you their cell phone number. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, not like to my people, like, you call, I answer, and what's up? You know, I'm riding my skateboard right now. What's going on? What you been right. up to? You know, and that's how the conversation started. And I had, the funny thing is, I had Verizon Wireless, and it was terrible by my house. And so all my calls would drop all the time. 80% of my calls would drop. And I'm talking to Rafael Sadiq, and I'm praying that my calls do not drop. This man <laughs> got to take, he do not have to take another call, nothing. So as I'm talking to him, um, he's like letting me know that he really likes our music. Um, you know, what are we involved in? What are we doing? He's just really curious about what's going on. And um, he said, you know, I'm not signing anybody at the moment, but, you know, I would love to kind of help you guys do whatever you're trying to do. And that's kind of where it ended. And, and then um, and then it was like, you guys can come by the studio one day or whatnot. And then I couldn't get back in touch with him for about a week, right? <laughs> so I'm like, shit, ah, shit, it's gone. He's, he's opportunity gone, right? <laughs> um, but then we, we did a performance one day and I, I hit him up and he finally hit us back and we set up a meeting date. We met with him and he let us know actually that Tedra Moses was the one who really told him to follow back up with us. Because oh. he went back and listened to the music and let her hear it. And she was like, you should really, you know, follow up with these, these, right. guys, these kids at the time. Uh, so that was a, just an awesome fact. And I actually thanked her <laughs> um, later on, years later, cause I didn't get a chance to meet her around those times. Right. Um, so at that time, we met Raphael, we played him our album, and he turns around to us and says, I want to sign y'all, which was kind of blew my mind because he said he wasn't signing anybody. So I had no expectations of nothing, literally yeah, nothing, push off. every step of the way, no <laughs> expectations of anything, yeah. you know, none at all. Um, so 
course, we kind of freaked out, geek out or whatever. And so that was a, a process that took about uh, several months. But at that time, um, he was gearing up to release a new album. And he decided to let us open up for a couple of shows for him locally. Um, so we got a chance to do like uh, the House of Blues in uh, San Diego, the House of Blues in LA. Um, we went up to San Francisco and did the Fillmore in San Francisco. Okay, and so like you're you're touring with him, and did you just tour with him, or how did it work? Did like did he say get in the studio now and start working on a project, or was it just touring and was it touring with basically only him? Well, see, see mind you, we had already been like we had home studio. We had been recording. That's all we ever did. Okay. So he before we started touring with him, he was opened up the studio to us. And which we were reluctant to use because we got accustomed to our, I mean, it sounds crazy that you're reluctant to use Raphael's big studio, but we were so used to what we did, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. we had a lot of music already. And um, when he decided to take us on tour, it was just us and him. He took us as his opening act. Uh, okay. On his run. So he took us as an opening act there. And then um, he said, if you guys, this, I mean, when you're independent, this is something that, that people should pay attention to too. Okay, so when we signed, we didn't necessarily get money per se, or a lot of money at the time. Um, and can you say how much? I don't even remember to be honest, because we had two options. He went to sign us as writers, and he yeah. went to sign us as artists. Okay, yeah, I get it. Um, there was an advance in place for the writers. I don't think there was an advance in place for the artists at the time. But where we where we were, I mean, we were pretty much nowhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, he just saw potential in us. So uh, that that kind of took a while. And then we we went, when we did the film in San Francisco, he decided to take us to the East Coast. If you guys can fund yourself on the East Coast, that's why I brought that part up. He said, y'all can fund, because I can't necessarily afford that right now, based off of, I guess, he taught us a lot about touring <laughs> All right. and overhead. Okay, you so this is what, it, what exactly did you learn about touring? That the overhead for artists to go on tour can almost max out what your profit can be, um, depending on what you, he takes a full-fledged band on tour. Like, he's not taking a DJ and, you know, a track or nothing like that. Right. It's a full-fledged band. So those are expensive tours to really do. You know, you got to put everybody up. You got to get everybody their outfits. You got to make sure everybody eat. You got to, you know, travel with everybody. So it's a lot to accommodate. That would have been pretty tough on the books to have us be part of that accommodation. So luckily, like I said earlier, you know, my mom had already hopped on supporting us. She was part of the management team at the time, you know. Um, and she's been in business for over 30 years. So she had a successful business. And when she was helping us a bit, not to where she can just, you know, hey, 50K, hundred K, there you go. But she's yeah. like, here, two hundred dollars. Y'all need that for the show? Okay. Here, five hundred dollars. You need that? All right. You know. So she helped us get to the East Coast. We got a chance to tour with him on the East Coast, and this is probably in two thousand nine, I believe. Um, mind you, we met him in two thousand eight. So a year later is when we finally went on tour with him. Um, we did the East Coast, West Coast. Then when we came back, we couldn't get a show. Why we not? Get a show. Uh, because we hadn't built enough of a buzz locally. We had the opportunity based off of who we met, when we met them, right. and they were going on tour. Yeah. But even just that notion wasn't enough for us to just get in anybody's thing. So we literally right. hitting up, we get back and we're like, okay, we gotta find a show. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> so basically, show, you know? You got out there, you, you, you have this big name, and now you're like, oh, we're in front of all these people. We're going to be a bit of following just out of association. And mm -hmm. you get back home and realize, I can't even get a show where I'm from right. by yourself. So were y'all able um, to ever overcome that hump? Like, what did y'all yes, do? The show? definitely did. We started hitting up um, venues and promoters online. Yeah. We started going to websites, hitting them up. Like, you know, we, we like to play. We like to play them. We finally got a show. Um, Novena Carmel, she is actually the daughter of Sly from Sly and the Family Stones, which we kind of found out later, but she gave us our first show. It was this place at the Little Temple, and we played that place like almost every week for I don't know how long. 
Like, okay. So we you almost had a residency. Like, like you were like a house game, a house band there almost. You weren't really bringing in a fan base. Y'all just said, we're going to build a fan base by being in that spot. We kind of we kind of did that, yeah. We kind of did that, but we were very energetic on stage. Like we had a really good stage performance, I would say that, because we were able to attract people, even without a following at the time. Mm -hmm. If people saw our performance, they would want us to perform. So that's how we began to build our name. We began to build names through like promoters. So then we started to that started to evolve into more shows, and then we started to be able to do the rock scene. And then we were able to do the Viper Room. And then we were getting requests from the Viper Room. We did the Viper Room like almost six, six okay. times in a row, six weeks in a row. You know what I mean? So, so what was the biggest really audience fun. that y'all were in at the time? You said the biggest audience? Well, not the biggest audience y'all 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 were in. The biggest um, audience y'all brought out, as you said, you elevated these areas. Um, You know, it was difficult to keep track of the way we were doing it because we were always trying to put ourselves in front of another audience, in a sense. So we, our, our draw wasn't part of our focus, which, is, which isn't a good thing, honestly. You live and you learn, because it wasn't part of our focus. So we didn't have an idea of what our draw was. We knew we got up to probably 100 plus to 200, maybe. You know what I mean? We could pull that. Later on, we figure that later out, like, oh, okay. So you were in a bigger venue then. You might have had some people coming for you, but you were also a part of other shows, right? Other people were there. Yeah, so the way they were doing it out here was they always tried to, it was kind of like the pay-for-play model. We did one pay-for-play gig, and we never did it again. Um, towards, they wanted to get a number of acts. So it's always a number mm -hmm. of lineups. It's always a number of independent acts that they have. It'll be a band, it'll be a rapper, it'll be a this. Sometimes it's a comedian, sometimes it's just a couple of performances. So we were just taking everything because one thing that Raphael told us, he said, take every show you can get. He said, take everything that you can get because you're learning and you're going to get better. So when you're ready for that big show, you'll be ready for it. A lot of times people get a big show and they're not ready for it. Right, so you got that practice oh, in. So, exactly. uh, two questions then. One, from your perspective, you said y'all did pay for play, but y'all never did it again. Why didn't y'all yeah. do pay for play after y'all did it the first time? Well, first of all, it was just a terrible experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> just the way the venue operated, just within itself. It was okay. like, yeah. it was a terrible association. The pay for play was just, um, you go, of course, you buy, you, you pay like 200 bucks or something like that, 300, 400, you get some tickets, you try and sell those tickets. We were able to sell an, a number of tickets, whatever you don't sell, you got to pay back. We have to pay back a little bit. Um, <laughs> and then- Go work know, for me, basically. Y'all were the marketing team. Yeah, I know that model. And that's what we learned. We, we learned that it was a whole new um, industry of promoters. So mind you, like, this is probably around 2000, nine maybe mm -hmm. my sister got signed in 2000 right 1999 released her project in 2000 so as i'm learning the business i'm learning references point reference points from an industry that had completely changed so mm -hmm. when i hear my sister talking about a promoter who actually goes out and promotes the show yeah exactly to get people in there that was obsolete in 2010 and 20 2009 it was literally get these acts to try and pull people in and have them go promote Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I had two different reference points. So we're learning a new a new industry at the time. So that was part of us doing the pay pay uh, pay to play. Got you. Um, you know, and then after that, not only did we realize that it wasn't a great idea, we also realized that we didn't have to anymore. You know, Got after it. a while, we were being requested to perform. Got we it. For shows. This is you a know? great point right here because. There's multiple routes and multiple models, and I know I've done videos. No, I might not have done a video. I probably sent an email newsletter out talking about how you, there are artists who get shows that have very small followings, and especially on social media, you might not even see. They might not even have a social media page, uh, to be honest. You, but these days they might have one. But there's different ways to go about business, and one of the ways is like what Tuco and his band did. And what was the name of the band? The Boogie. The Boogie. 
Tuco and the, was it Tuco and the Boogie or just the Boogie? It was the Boogie. T H A G I E. Yeah, just and the so Boogie. The, <laughs> the Boogie. What they did was there is a model, and I've known people to build a relationship with a promoter and go from the standpoint of that it might be a promoter who has many venues and they have like this entire vertical, a small venue, a big venue, or it's just different levels and many different um, venues, and they'll say, hey. We, let us perform in your smallest venue. And then they perform in that smallest venue and they try to pack it out. They might try to market for themselves, bring people to come in. Now they can pack out this venue. They show the promoter that we can pack this out and they keep leveling up until, because now the promoter trusts them. They say, hey, you can pack this out. Then I'll give you a shot at this next one. And you continue to do that. Then you actually continue to level up and get bigger venues if you're also being requested that's also uh, well other promoters hear about it they might start making those requests now with that being said depending on your city um like you know the boston's the new york's atlanta's those are getting a little bit more tied up by uh, a lot of the venues are starting to be owned by a uh, live nation stuff like mm -hmm. that these days i'm not sure if it's like that out in la um oh yeah okay yeah so <laughs> it'll be a little bit rougher and you gotta you really have to find those promoters but if you do those ones who aren't tied up by those type of contracts, they and they have their own like uh, boutique uh, venues. It'll be easier because they're looking for work in a different way these days. Since Live Nation is coming with that heavy competition, um, had to definitely make that note because it's something clear that you you guys definitely did. And I know I never talked about it on the channel before, um, but what do you guys? So now y'all are before me. Y'all are built. Y'all y'all's following um to an mm -hmm. extent y'all built y'all's following or credibility with the promoters so y'all are getting requested for shows you don't have to look for shows anymore but you got signed so did y'all get a project that had to be released did, did the project ever come out what was that we, project? Did, we did release a project we had a um project called love the boogie still this shit that we released through belma records which was raphael's label at the time okay um we released the project because Mind you, we really, I felt like we were young and, you know, naive in some ways, and we saw a certain way to do it, um, where I saw my sister get a record deal before releasing music. She did a compilation back in the day, but she had a record deal before releasing music. It mm -hmm. wasn't the, to the streets and then build like that. It was like, get signed, release right. music. You know what I mean? So we were trying to get signed at the time. You know, so we hadn't even released the music that we felt were our best music. And funny thing, Raphael actually said to us one day, he said, where's this stuff at? He, it, I think it dawned on him to ask, like, where's this stuff at? He was like, it's not out. He was like, wait, y'all are performing songs that are not out? No, we were performing music that wasn't out. And then that's when we had more of the conversation, like, okay, let's release this project, you know? <laughs> we were really... I mean, mind you, when I hit him up, it wasn't an ask. I wasn't asked for anything, so it was no expectation. So we got enthralled into a lot of things that were new territory that we were learning. Yeah. You know, and the industry had changed. So we did release the Bell, uh, Love the Boogie Still, this shit on Bumble Records. And then we did a couple videos for some of those. Um, but I would definitely say a couple of things that I really learned from being signed to an artist with a name and not having a name was it wasn't until we started to build on our own whether we were even able to leverage his name. Mm. You know what I mean? So, so, when, so it's like impressions that people, I feel, kind of had to have at the time. So maybe if your friend saw us somewhere and made a mention or said, oh, I know who they are, that those references start to have to occur before we can be like, okay, you're Raphael, we're signing Raphael's label, or you know, he might come out to the show, or we can put him on a flyer, like Raphael Sadiq presents the boogie in some instance, whatever. So whenever we did a, a maybe an event ourselves, then he was like, yeah, you guys can kind of use my name, but. So he didn't let you, he said, don't use my name? No, he said you can. He said, you, you can use my name. On what you know what I'm saying? At, at first, did he say, don't use my name until y'all start to build the name? Or he no. just I'll use it right out the gate. No, we just understood how we could maybe leverage that a little bit better. You Got know, it. That's and we had the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, and then he's like, Yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but we weren't getting any nobody was doing anything for us because we were signed to Raphael Sadiq. 
Yeah. It happened after people liked who, what we were doing and they liked the music and they liked performance and they're like, mm -hmm. and you guys are signing Raphael. It wasn't nothing you're signing Raphael to be, okay, come on, let's go. It wasn't any of that, yeah. you know? So later on, we started to do like, um, it was the UCLA Jazz Fest in which Raphael performed, I think Nas performed. It was a huge, huge lineup, quadrant. Like, so we were on, filled with like, a lot of known acts, you know what I mean? So we were getting that. And then Bilal had uh, requested us to perform with him. When he had options, he chose us out of his choices. Nika Costa requested us to perform with her after a while. So we started to get, you know, a, a bigger name for ourselves after that. But one thing was definitely we had to work before the association even mattered. Right. Yeah, you know? because for one, people here, I mean, they meet people all the time that are related to someone in some form of fashion. And then on top of that, like you said, if your music's not good and we don't like like you yourself, it just is what it is. This is why a lot of artists, there are a lot of artists out there who are signed to some kind of name. <laughs> and oh, yeah. you just think, oh, it's gonna, it's gonna blow up. Nah, mm. not necessarily. Like what happened to them? I'm not gonna name any <laughs> <laughs> groups or anything like that. Since mm -hmm. this is a recording, you know what I'm saying? But um, what, um, okay. That's, that, that, that gives me a good idea, and I think that's pretty helpful when we talk, when an artist watch this, as far as your story. Mm -hmm. But what about the contest? Because I know you said you guys were about to be on Rolling Stone's cover. Give me a little bit of insight into that story, what that whirlwind process was like. You know, just, you can summarize it real quick. Um, so this is the thing about just kind of working and not being conscious. So we had a little bit of hindsight. We did a, a show at the House of Blues, like yeah. the foundation room or whatever. It had this like smaller part of the House of Blues. So we used to perform there pretty often too. We played everywhere when we were in LA. Just play, that's what I think. Um, and then we got an inquiry one time, specifically asking us from a random, num uh, random email, specifically asking us who, what time we were going on. You know, this came to management, and so management found it a little like odd. Like, hmm. <laughs> what time are they going up? You know, to the management email, it's not like a, it's not like somebody texting you. It just right, right, right. Like, okay, let me take a look at this. Um, whoever that was apparently showed up. We don't even know. And then uh, one day, randomly, we got an email from Rolling Stone magazine. This is like, so we're working, we're playing shows. We're doing bigger shows, as, you know, Blas requesting us, and we're doing shows with Nika Costa. We're doing shows just all, just all over the place. We're all over the place. Um, so we get an email from Lonely Sound Magazine. It was very vague, you know, and my mom at the time was part of the management team was just like, what if they want y'all to be able to come? Like, that's, that's ridiculous. That's craziness. Like, we, we aren't anybody going to be on the cover. She just randomly said, and then we did a, a conference call with them, and they were doing this competition in which they were selecting 16 acts from across the country. This is Rolling Stone magazine, so it doesn't even sound real, right? So <laughs> they're selecting 16 acts from across the country, and um, we're one of them. Oh. We're like, how did you hear of us? We, we, we still don't really know how they heard of us. Um, I think one person said that they heard uh, a compilation that we was a part of called the um, Red Hot in Rio. It's a compilation that they've, they've done. It's a couple okay. of compilations. They've done a couple of them, and a few songs have been big out there. It's like Vex been on there. John Legend was on the same compilation. So I think one reference was there, and then we potentially think it was a person who inquired about what time we went on because after we were in the competition, they sent another email kind of alluding to having some involvement. But right, I think right. that was somebody who was at Atlantic Records um, who was doing the competition with Rolling Stone Records. Got it, okay. So with this competition, they chose 16 people. You win the opportunity to, you know, win a record deal with Atlantic Records and be on the cover of Rolling Stone Magazine. Uh, after that, they chopped it down to eight, <clears throat> um, and the eight were chosen, four were chosen from fans, and four were chosen from 
Rolling Stone staff. We were part of the four chosen from the Rolling Stone staff, you know? Um, so when you're chosen as a top eight, they fly you to New York, you get to perform for executives at Rolling Stone Magazine and executives at Atlantic. We were got to do an interview with uh, Ture. Um, oh. We went to different events out there and we toured the Rolling Stone Magazine facilities, did a whole photo shoot for Rolling Stone Magazine. Like Garnier Fruit Tea sponsored it, so we got a whole bunch of shit from them. And then, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> did um so after that we did that whole ordeal and then now it's just about the fans so now we're like having to hit the streets crazy and trying to build up this like fanfare in a sense because we had an interesting journey towards we were uh, people within entertainment have always been a fan of what we did so we were able i was able to leverage that mm. you know um our focus hadn't been fanfare because we didn't understand there's things to understand about fans and a fan base and a target demographic right. that artists aren't in, aren't always in tune with sometimes you innately get it but if you don't know it you don't know it um, yeah. and we were very experimental at the time so we didn't know exactly who our fan base was we were kind of looking for them to find us because <laughs> our music was weird and different and shit you know what i mean yeah. um so then we had to go back to la and then try and get a lot of people to vote for us at that time but they ended up you know, releasing uh, magazine issues with the contestants of it. So we got a chance to be in Rolling Stone, I think like three issues um, that year. This was, I mean, Rolling Stone, I mean, yeah. any, any form of that. And then three of them is like crazy. Um, but I, a band from Canada, supposed to be all across the country, actually won the competition. When you have a whole country behind you, it's kind of easy to <laughs> ban. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, we're trying to get okay. regions, and yeah, I got a whole country. So yeah. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember you mentioned some stuff. I mean, if you care to talk about it, like when when you were about to win that competition, mm -hmm. I remember you said you were kind of having some doubt if you whether you even wanted to win the competition. Right. So as we've been doing this interview, I've. I've kind of shed light on our missteps, on our not knowing things, on our not understanding things. And a lot of artists don't understand a lot of stuff. Right. And mind you, I got, and I skipped over this part, but after 15, my dad said, you have to go to college, which I didn't want to. I went to do music, but he said, you're going. So I went to college and got my degree in music business. Mm. Okay. I got my degree in music business and still was ignorant to so many things that I had to understand. Yeah. Um, and my sister was in, like, science. mind you, this is so many I, things you don't know. I, I <laughs> did, especially what I, what I find in a lot of music business schools, man, it just seems like a lot of them focus very much so on just business, more so as if you worked at a record label, you know, or you were in a, a situation, but none, none of them really hone in on how you build something, uh, particularly That's if you wound up. And that's the most important part because yep. you lose sight when you see what's already been built. You're looking at artists who've been built and trying to do what they've done and you don't know how they was built. Nope. You know, and so we didn't even- No, you're not trying to do what they've done. You're trying to do what they're doing, not exactly. realizing how they got there. Exactly, yep. you know, and I feel like 90% of artists fall subject to that. And, you yep. know, we were much of an exception. Um, so, when we were in the competition, it was a lot of work actually, because we had to try and promote more than we've ever promoted ever. I mean, this is a chance to be on Rolling Stone Magazine, like we're gonna hit the, the ground running. Um, but I knew that we had a lot of things that we weren't prepared for. Hmm. This is based off of you having to be a human as a person okay. and deal with all that's going to come with what doing we i'm just shedding light on some of the missteps that we had along the way but we had started doing music when we were 17 and 15 at this time we're probably in our early 20s and we had to grow up doing this as humans and people and get past our issues and our you know missteps and us trying to figure out who we are as human beings so you got those issues already internally swirling 
right, right. as as much as we're family and we still our family is still like this but we are no longer group at the same time mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what i mean um but in that instance i had really realized that okay this could be really dope to be on rolling stone magazine this could get signed with Atlantic Records, even though I knew the, the, the deal was a shitty deal because they generally are. We had to sign the deal before we even got into competition. That was part of it. That um, is how long American you... Idol or something like that. Yeah, American you know? Idol, all these. That's how they work. <laughs> exactly. So we Bad signed deal. it with Atlantic Records. That never was the deal. <laughs> so, yeah. mind you. Um, but it seemed like everything I, I would have wanted and I didn't want it, mm. partly. Okay. Because this, this, this doesn't shake how hard I, I worked for it. I just knew we weren't ready. And if we were to get it, the way that things were at the time, I felt like I would have had so much pressure. And it would have, a lot of pressure would have fallen on me. You were like the leader of the group? You could kind of say that. I would never say that back then, but I understand that I was the initiator. I was the, let's do this. I was, this is the name. I was, let's get the, you know what I'm saying? Let's get in studio. I'm like, we could do this, y'all. That, you know what I'm saying? Uh So when you end up, and you end up pushing like that and you get this huge ordeal that's thrown over you, it's something you got to really consider. So you're not carrying the weight of just your burdens. You're carrying the weight of two other people's burdens with you. And you're also having to navigate something that could be just unpredictable. The thing is you want music, you want these dreams, you want these goals, and you get close enough to it and you start to see what it's really like. And you had to see how you exist, how you how you currently exist in that situation. It may not be a healthy thing, and you know awareness I, is a huge it thing. May not be a healthy thing. Yeah. You know, so you have to take that in. So when I was taking those in, I was just like, "Wow, we have, you know, this opportunity, but we're not ready for this." Yep. Hey, well, all right. Not- so I gotta I gotta start <laughs> real quick. Um, Because that's that having that level of self awareness to be able to project and say this is what it's gonna take and this is what it's like, and be able to say I'm not ready for this, we're not ready for this. Um, Mm -hmm. It's it's smart. It's gonna be useful anywhere um, in business Mm -hmm. and life in general, Um, especially in this business, especially in this business. But because you said like you you spoke with so much passion, and I get what what you meant by what it's seeing what it's really like. But can you go into more detail of what you were thinking and seeing it was more it was like? Because I know some of these people who watch might start to think some of that more mystical, like, you know, and create all these images, oh, like, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I know that's not what you're talking about. So go no, ahead and I'm detail. I'm talking about when you, when you go on YouTube and literally write music industry and all that pops up as like Illuminati videos. Yeah, like none of that shit. It's, it has nothing. To, that's so crazy. That, that almost starts so <laughs> I knew. I, I know where some people could think. So I, I want you for that. that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, it had nothing to do with that. It had to. You. One thing that you have to understand is that you can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing it, you meet a lot of people on your journey. And the way I am as a person is that I'm going to try and make sure that you're involved with, with me is not a waste of your time. You know what I'm saying? So you have all these individuals who you're ideally trying desperately not to let down. You know, so you put the pressures of the manager, you put in the pressures of, you know, Raphael Sadiq, you put in the pressures of everybody you enrolled in like this idea, even the group members on you, you put in the pressures of, you know, all these different elements mm-hmm. that it takes. So any misstep, is a let down because you got to realize that people were selling you, people putting their name in association with you. You know what I'm saying? If they're mm-hmm. selling it, they say you need to get behind this sector, I'm associated with the sector, I'm out here rooting for you. Your fuck up is everybody's fuck up, yeah. you know. And we had certain fuck ups, <laughs> you know, that we had to get past, yeah. <laughs> and I just felt like we weren't 
at a place towards um we were past our fuck ups. You know, and that's that's being honest. That's just being honest. We weren't past our fuck ups and we weren't gonna be able to be healthy human beings and win that competition and be signed or Atlanta probably would have been shelved. We probably would have went into a deep, you know, depression and all that stuff. Uh you know, so those things you just gotta consider it didn't scare me, but I was realistic about what it took. And that's how I understood what it took, because it's closer to it. So now you don't just have the idea, you got the factual, actual, what it's kind of like. Yeah. You got the factual, actual, what the meetings are like, you got all the players involved, you got a PR person, you got somebody trying to book you for shows, you know what I'm saying? You got all these players involved and it's on you. And mm. thankfully, yeah, the group, we had certain fuck ups and things that we need to get past, but thankfully we were able to figure that shit out together. You know what I'm saying? Even though I felt like a lot of it was on me, I still had them too at the same time. If you're somebody by yourself, just just consider how some of these artists have to deal with these pressures. It's not, yeah. it's a real thing, you know, and you see them crack, you see them break. It's real. Yeah. Well, you've seen you it. Know? Everybody's not built for this. I yeah. Definitely yeah, I definitely thought that that's a super important thing for people to hear just because, I mean, some of these artists, people who, who watch this, have they either been through it um, already or it might be going through it but there's just so many cases of people having a weight on the world of their shoulders especially feeling like they're in it alone because that is a point um, that it gets to um, even as an artist as an entrepreneur I know some of y'all are just entrepreneurial or managers mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. like it just it gets to points where you feel like you're in it alone but mm -hmm. you gotta be able to have that self-awareness, know what's for you or what's going to be the healthy option for you. And then at the end of the day, um, realize that other, other people are going through that too. And then mm -hmm. make the best option for you going forward, you know? So, so it's good that you, obviously you, you didn't win anyway. Canada had it all. No, up. Canada but, won. But at least you, <laughs> had, you had that perspective with a, without it having to happen to you um, right. on, that, on that level because mm -hmm. um, you were already starting to have happen to you well cool man um i want to go ahead and before we get out of here i definitely got to fast forward to some of the artist work you're doing right now um mm -hmm. the back end what, what are some of the things that you do a little bit more we don't have to go deep into it but just give a summary of what you're working on now well right now um, i'm working with my niece who okay. uh, I mentioned early on the journey like we literally started counting bars in the room together um <laughs> she went more so into songwriting actually so Okay. She's been writing for all types of artists from Kanye and Ty Dalla and Chris Brown, like all types of people, you know. Yeah. So but I'm working with her and getting um, her artist stuff together, but it's more so we're approaching it from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. Me having taken a break from music after the group situation. Uh, I went back to the family business to grow the family business. Um, and I took a lot of lessons from that and added it to music because music's the only thing I've ever known. So I'm like, damn, why, you know, I need to apply this to music or why not enough people applying this to music? Yeah. Uh, and, and my niece being in a position to where she's ready to do her, her music as an artist, I'm like, well, there's ways that we can kind of do it and make this a business. You know, let's approach this like an actual business. Let's get incorporated let's look at the accounting let's you know what i'm saying let's build the marketing plans let's build the strategy so right now i'm i'm really focused on working with her and other artists as well that you know grew the company that we're doing so really label basically or management it's it's a, a multimedia company Got there's it. some label services that are there um I wouldn't say management. Okay. I management, just to touch on management is like babysitting and being a messenger oh, sometimes. Yeah. It takes a special <laughs> type of individual to manage. Yes, you gotta <laughs> like managers and I respect the hell out of them, man. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I definitely respect a lot of people so ask much. me to be a manager. I say I can't do it, but the one mm. right now, I'll point them to people I think are dope managers, though. <laughs> yeah. Some people are great. Some people are great with it. So we're uh we're doing that um more so through a company company type of dynamic rather than a management dynamic with uh, some artists working with a new artist right now and on his rollout for his project. Okay. 
Um, I know. Go ahead. Well, just also why it popped in my head, uh, one big lesson I hear from your story, which I probably haven't even mentioned enough, um, or maybe even at all in any of the videos on this channel, there's a lot of people who are industry popular. Like mm. they have industry fans. Mm. And that's different than having real fans. And you guys were industry popular. Y'all have many industry fans. There's so many groups or like, duos or just people I've seen that, you know, they've been in the industry passed around since they've been 15 years old, 11 years old. Now they're 26 and still haven't actually got pushed out to have real fans. And somehow they're just going back and forth and li living in artists, maybe perform like Vanessa, maybe performing for people or maybe outright here and there, but it's a completely different thing than actually getting your own fan base to sustain and become and build as artists yourself. It is. And to add to that, that's the most important thing. Like, for <laughs> someone who has definitely made a lot of relationships on the industry level, the most important thing that you can have is a fan base. And it wasn't that we didn't have fans, it's that we didn't understand how to nourish that relationship. And we didn't understand community building. Y'all didn't appreciate you know it enough. You know, exactly. And we didn't even know how to appreciate them enough because we we got our eyes on the stars. You know what I'm saying? One, two, three, four, five people don't look like a stadium. So when you don't have that mindset, you don't always know how to really take care of those relationships properly mm. because you don't understand the value in them. And when you don't understand the value in them, you, know, you, you lose that value. And it's the most valuable thing that you, you have, especially as a new act. You know what I mean? Really? So industry famous don't really mean shit, to be honest with you. It don't. It does yeah. not. You may be able to get in and get some money, but you're not. Your, your fan base is your leverage or your following. They're going to be the people on your Instagram numbers. They're going to be the people on your Twitter numbers, your YouTube numbers, all that stuff. That's, that's it. That's what you leverage against everybody in the industry. You know what I'm saying? But you can't leverage the industry against the people because half the time they don't give a damn. The people do not <laughs> care. Yeah. That's why yeah. that, I, tell, I tell people, oh, industry plan or 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 super organic artist or just somebody in the subway. People really don't care for the most part. Like whichever way you come, they either like you or you don't. Like you can get in. It doesn't matter how you got in front of them. Once you're in front of them, do they like you or do you not? Do, or do you not like you can name who signed you or who you got relationships with most people won't, they won't care in the same way you don't know you know all the agents in the nba or all the gms and all these people and you just know the players and you got your favorite players you might not even know everybody on the bench on the team that's the same thing it goes for artists like at the end of the day it's your production and what do they and do they like who you um who you are what you rock with as a brand that's it yeah that's, that's, that's all the way it, because you can only leverage that against other industry people who know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. You know that's the only exactly. time it works, and it works there. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, outside that office, it's, you, you're just a regular person again. <laughs> exactly. Yep. All right, well, hey, man, I think that's a great part to leave off. Um, if you guys do not recognize Tuco, he is Tuco from Music ID TV. Um, he does a lot of great business to business videos on that channel. Um, when I say B2B, I'm talking about, hey, you, you artists are a business in yourself. So his information is valuable, but he's giving you industry knowledge, updated industry news through that channel. Also going, you know, have him on this channel back again. You guys will definitely see more of him. Other than that, man, I think you've done yeah. great. I really appreciate this story. It's one of my lengthier interviews. I'm sure it might be the longest, you know, <laughs> congratulations. But ah. the, the stuff you said, man, is so valuable. And I hope they watch all the way through. I, only, I might break this thing in more than one part, but like there's okay. some really valuable pieces in here that you can only get in the context of the story instead of just giving some random advice. So I appreciate that for real, for real. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on the channel. Um, once again, I, I truly do appreciate it. I'm glad you are back doing you know, what you do. I, I definitely, just to touch on, I think, you know, I, I started Music ID TV because it wasn't a lot of resources online that I found at the time. So having you do your channel is very important to me for artists. You know what I'm saying? The reason why I do Music ID TV is to try and keep 
artists informed about the news because it was a lot of stuff I learned that I didn't know. You know what I mean? And a lot of news that was happening that I couldn't take advantage of because I was ignorant to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, just really t- take advantage of these resources that everybody's really trying to put out there because everybody's trying to pull back the veil of the music industry. It's one of the biggest veils out there. <laughs> you know, in entrepreneurship, people tell you what, what we're wrong, but yeah. this is different. You know what I mean? And so, um, once again, thank, thanks for having me. Dope, dope. I appreciate that, man. Hey, everybody, follow to go check out Music ID TV. I'll put that information in the description below. Definitely give me them comments of what you think about this interview um, and ask questions, man. Tuco, you need to come back, check this interview out, and see ask, answer questions in the comment section if you can. I'm get I'll that. All right, I appreciate it. And other than that, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.